Thank you for the invitation. It's it's a great pleasure to, to be here and to discuss uh, this uh, paper that is uh, uh, one of my last sort of uh, research uh, paper on, on normative uh, uh, issues. In, in the first part of my research or my life uh, as a researcher, I did work a lot on international political theory and normative stuff. I worked on a lot of democracy. These days, uh, my research is much more on empirical or IR, classically understood. Um, but there was something that was left out of my previous research on global democracy. Um, and this is precisely uh, the, 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 the bilateral uh, dimension. Um, a lot of research about democracy at the international level focuses on, on international institutions, how to democratize them, how to democratize global governance, um, which is important, um, which is where also I, I, I've been working in the, in the past. Um, but there is this other side of the, of, the, of, the, of the democratic theory that I think needs to be um, reassessed uh, or indeed assessed because uh, as you will see, uh, there has been very limited, almost non-existent uh, research and literature on, on this, on the topic that I'm going to talk about today. So if you want, I mean, this paper, it's really just uh, an attempt to open up a debate. It's, it's not a, 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 a paper that contributes to a long-standing debate. Uh, if you Google and try to... Uh, to find the articles and book on democratic foreign policy or democracy and foreign policy, very, 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 very few you find. Mm -hmm. And basically on the normative dimension, even less. So um, it is a bit of a, a kind of uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea here, well, first of all, I should clarify that this is not about democratic and republican like uh, US parties, this is about democratic theory. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with uh, which maybe was the, the thing you were thinking, I don't know, uh, but there's nothing to do with the, uh, the U.S. parties. Hmm? This is about um, uh, democratic tier. Uh, and it's, it's an attempt to think about um, what are the boundaries of democratic tiers and whether we should extend our reflection on democracy also to the field of foreign policy, which is a field that has been traditionally left out of democratic tier. Hmm? So, uh, and I do think this is needed for, num for a number of reasons, for political reasons and for normative reasons. For political reasons because foreign policy is very important and is actually becoming even more important in current times. Um, but also because uh, this is a bit, a piece of a wider a picture of democratic theory that is missing, and so if you want to have a comprehensive and sort of consistent uh, theory of democracy, uh, you need to engage also with that dimension. Mm -hmm. There are a number of issues that are controversial about this. What is legitimate, what is illegitimate in foreign policy from a democratic perspective? Is a foreign policy that violates human rights legitimate from a democratic perspective or not? One that promotes aggressive economic policy, a foreign policy that wages war. Is that consistent or inconsistent with democracy? A foreign policy that commits genocide, is that democratic or not? To what extent? One that launches cyber attacks, one that deploys proxies in order to pursue its own foreign policy objectives. A foreign policy that uses secret services in its own daily activities. Is, to what extent this is democratic or not? A foreign policy that perhaps avoids or skips or kind of marginalizes uh, parliamentary oversight. Is that democratic or not? I, th I do think that each of these questions is, is, is very important, very controversial, and actually doesn't find an immediate answer from standard democratic theory. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we need to broaden the democratic theory in order to empower it, to be able to address these questions and others that we will discuss today, uh, because these are very important questions. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to revise the principles of underpinning the, the theory of democracy. I'm simply 
arguing that we need to expand their scope. Uh, of course, I will say something about principles, I mean, democratic principles, just underpinning this, but I, I, I rely on very standard understanding of democracy. Mm. I'm, simply, I'm simply arguing that if we stick to those principles, then we need to revise the way we conceptualize and think about foreign policy. Okay? So it's not a fundamental work about ultimate principles, but it's about how democratic principles should be applied. In, um, in, uh, to the foreign policy. And uh, as I said, I mean, this is a kind of opening, uh, it's an attempt to open up a debate. Ultimately, uh, my answer to this would be, will be that when we think about democracy, when we measure democracy, when we assess whether a country is democratic or not, or to what extent a country is democratic, because it's not black and white, it's not zero one, but it's by degrees. We cannot skip its own foreign policy actions. That's part and parcel of the democratic qualities of a country. While traditionally, if you ask anybody and if you read any book about democratic theory, the only requirements or criterion for, for democracy are just domestic criteria. Oh, you need to have multiple parties, you need to have participation, elections, uh, division of powers, uh, checks and balances. But nothing to do, nothing, nothing that says something about how the country should behave internationally. I do think this, there is a flow, there is a problem here, so that's, that's what, what I'm trying to do. Okay, so, okay. small, I, how I'm going to discuss today this issue. Well, I, I will map a bit the terrain, saying what has been said on this topic, as I said, very limited on in IR and IPT, International Relations, International Political Theory. Then I would say something why, uh, I mean, conceptualizing the democratic, democratization theory as an ongoing project, mm -hmm. which in a way faces new boundaries and new challenges every day. And this is, I think, a new frontier for, democra for democra democratic theory. And then I will talk about specific about uh, what I understand uh, to be uh, a, a consistent and legitimate or altogether a democratic foreign policy uh, divided into three main dimensions, internal procedures or procedures, goals and actions. So what a, democratic, a foreign policy in order to qualify as a democratic should do in terms of procedures, in terms of foreign policy goals, and in terms of foreign policy actions. Okay. Um, if I have time, I would say something about ideal, non-ideal circumstances, um, uh, and then some conclusion with the typology. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, again, I, also this is very small, but you don't need the details here. What is important is if you take any index about democracy, mm -hmm. any ranking, any, you know, this Freedom House, uh, called Polity for, uh, V Democracy, I mean, there are many, and plus also more sort of theoretical uh, research and definitions about uh, democracy, you find that all the attributes, the quality, the, the features, the characteristics of democracy tend to be all uh, domestic, all internal. Mm -hmm. uh, that's it's common sense. It's obvious. I mean, anybody would say, would focus uh, entirely on internal domestic requirements for a system to qualify as democratic. That's how we think, and as how we have always thought uh, a democracy uh, in, needs to be. I mean, this is so how we. Uh, so, in terms of participation, inclusion. Contestation, rights, freedoms, but this is all a domestic discourse, okay? Um, Sometimes the only interest, the only sort of external variables that is taken into account in some uh, few uh, conceptualization of democracy is the variable of sovereignty. So they would say, okay, a system to, in order for a system to qualify as democratic, the system needs to have all these characteristics, plus needs to be sovereign. 
the idea is needs to be independent from foreign intervention or foreign influences. That's another very often implicit characteristics of the discourse about democracy, democratic theory. This is conceptualized as outside-in characteristics. So there should be no external interference on the democratic or domestic democratic sort of uh, dynamics, okay? But the opposite is never discussed. Should, there should be, or to what extent is legitimate an inside-out interference if we talk about democracy? To what extent the domestic dynamics internally that we suppose are in line with democracy, to what extent these dynamics can or are legitimate, are warranted to influence other countries? Because, of course, we don't live in a world of islands in which we are just isolated one from the other. We live in a world that is highly interdependent. So that's a basic assumption. Of course, you could say, okay, if we, where we live only in isolated, self-contained um, communities, which is also a standard thinking. I mean, if you take the classical theory of justice by rules, that's the idea is that these are self-containing the society, which is, of course, highly artificial and, uh, I mean, not in line with reality. I don't know what, what, what he was thinking at that time, but I mean, clearly, not corresponding to the reality. So, okay, outside in, no, okay. Sovereignty is an important principle, so countries should be free to determine themselves and to develop their own uh, domestic uh, dynamics, but nothing is said is about this uh, outs inside out dynamic, okay? <clears throat> now, in IR, uh, little is said about this, you know, I mean, of course, for, of course, for realism, endogenous factors are not important, they tend not to account for a variation in foreign policy, it doesn't really matter whether the country is democratic or not, what doesn't matter typically is the distribution of power in the international arena. So democracy is a pretty irrelevant variable, and domestic uh, variables are even less important. Uh, in the long tradition of liberal tradition, there is, of course, there has been much more attention to the domestic variables, typically the democratic peace theory, the idea that if a country is democratic internally, then that country will not wage war against another democratic country. Not what a country should do, but what a country is expected to do. Mm? Of course, we are we're talking in the classical IR terms. Uh, still, there is a bit of consideration there. But beyond that, um, there is no discussion about uh, what a demo how a democracy should behave internationally. Um, as a matter of fact, realism, the predominant sort of IR theory in the 20th century, developed precisely with a stark sort of denigration of the alleged naivete of early 20th century idealism. Um, for classical realist understanding, it seems that democracy stops at the border of a country. That international realm is not a realm for democratic thinking and practices. That democracy should be confined inside the territory, the national territory, and in the international anarchic system, other rules apply, not rules, not democratic rules. That's the classical understanding. Um, now, there's been a bit of discussion in the 50s and 70s, but exclusively focused on international procedures, looking at the debate, uh, but with a very weak ambition for theoretization. Um, uh, there's, a bit, there's been a bit of a discussion, normative discussion, about the EU, the European Union, in terms of the democratic deficit inside, but also how the EU should behave outside, claiming to be a democratic system, but still very, very limited. There has been some discussion about how civil society influence foreign policy on specific substantial foreign policy issues, but again, not conceptualized in normative terms. 
The normative discussion, of course, took place much more in IPT, international political theory, because that's what they are supposed to do. But uh, it went only really in one direction. Okay, you, want, you think uh, the democratic theory is insufficiently developed? Something is missing. What is missing? Well, we need to extend democracy beyond borders. How? Typically, well, let's democratize international institutions. All the debate about global democracy that we have been part of uh, was precisely on this, on, on sort of applying the democratic principles also at the international level intended as uh, inside international institutions of governance and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Why there has been little or no consideration about foreign policy? Well, first of all, because there was a kind of a <clears throat> political consideration about the importance of international organization. The idea in many um, political theories was the idea that uh, were you sort of uh, succeeding in democratizing international institutions, then there would be a trickle-down effect. And then also individual countries would democratize under the pressure of international organizations. So politically, the urgency was about democratizing international institutions rather than uh, talking about democracy in, in, in the countries. There was a, a much more, a much bigger emphasis on multilateralism than bilateralism. Foreign policy, I mean, international affairs were thought from a democratic perspective as a multilateral sort of business, not a bilateral, hence more focused on foreign policy, individual foreign policy. Um, democratic principles were simply most of the time assumed. Um, and, and also, perhaps there was an idea that uh, democratic theory had a, very, a more limited scope, because of course democracies are a limited number. Uh, and so talking about justice, a just foreign policy, or an ethical foreign policy, would have helped to reach a broader uh, constituency. Because of course you can make an argument about just foreign policy, or ethical foreign policy, for any country. But you cannot make an argument about democratic foreign, uh, foreign policy for a country that is not democratic. I mean, it, it sounds really a bit weird. Hmm? So maybe enlarging, talking about justice and ethics rather than talking about democracy um, made your sort of argument uh, more widely sort of applicable. Um, and then there was probably the issue about the limit effectiveness of uh, a democratic foreign policy in a world in which not every, con every country is democratic. So the idea is how can you be democratic in a system that is not entirely democratized yet. Um, but of course, uh, I mean, these reasons are important uh, in a way they helped us to understand why there was limited attention to this topic. Uh, but, but the current reality tells us that we need to focus on that. International organizations are democratizing international organizations is not enough. And we see now all the troubles, all the uh, struggles that are going on in international organizations, and to some extent all the marginalization of international organizations. And that tells you that if you bet and invest all your sort of normative thinking about international institutions, then you realize that international institutions are not relevant anymore in politics, in international politics. It seems you are better than <coughs> putting your money in something that is not uh, relevant to them. Um, instead, bilateralism is so important in international affairs today. Not only in this country, but in the world. And so you would say, okay, because bilateralism is so important, then foreign policy is important, then we should think about how to apply democracy to foreign policy. <coughs> Okay, um, now I will probably skip with this audience, I understand you are all, uh, most of you working on political theory or uh, <coughs> the PhD level, so I will not really uh, go a lot about sort of uh, um, um, democratic theory per se, because as I said, I mean, this is not a paper about democratic theory, I mean, 
in a way, my ambition is you take whatever conception of democratic principles you want to endorse, a more sort of deontological, a more consequentialist understanding of democratic principles. The idea is whatever ultimate principle you take, I mean, they should really be also implemented in foreign policy. So I will not go into a deep discussion about this, okay? I will, uh, in the paper I do a bit of this, but uh, for a lack of uh, time, I do think it's important to talk about foreign policy. I just assume that uh, there is a conception of democracy in which power should be divided in equal shares among the, the, the citizens, the members of the, the, the democratic uh, community. Uh, but then foreign policy. Why, why is so foreign policy so special? Because you would say, well, but then why don't you apply democratic theory to health policy, to labor policy, to economic policies? I mean, what's so special? I mean, but then we don't do this. Oh, well, there are, there are a bit of discussion about this, but limited. So why should we spend time and energy discussing about foreign policy? I mean, it's just one policy domain as many others. You simply focus on the core democratic theory and then all the well, I argue that uh, foreign policy is special because in the, all the other sort of uh, policy fields, the, the democratic congruence is immediate. Those who take decisions, those who bear the consequences, are members to some extent of the same community. Most of the time, of course, there are spillover effects, transnational effects, but foreign policy, no, foreign policy is just the opposite. What you do has immediate consequences on members of other communities, foreigners. So there is no congruence. So there is no idea that, well, they can, uh, I mean, they, they are the ones who elected the decision makers. No, well, they were excluded from the process. So because of this asymmetry, I think it's very important to, to think about um, the democratic characteristics of foreign policy. And I do think that this is something that makes foreign policy unique uh, in comparison with all the other policy fields. <clears throat> and uh, you need to un also understand that in classical sort of democratic theory, also in political science, more empirically oriented, um, foreign policy is considered a kind of um, a domain in which uh, all the democratic requirements uh, not only shouldn't apply, but don't apply. Why? Well, because parliamentary oversight, for instance, is usually considered not adequate for foreign policy. Um, instead, in, no, in most of the country, we see a, an increasing executivization of foreign policy. Foreign policy carried out and decided by the executive, not by the parliamentary uh, power. Um, democratic procedures are usually deemed to be unfit for foreign policy because they generate unstable results. And you need stability in foreign policy in order to be effective. There are two main reasons. Because public opinion mutate and change too quickly over time, while you need continuity in foreign policy. That's also why when you say, OK, from a, uh, there should be continuity in foreign policy, even moving from a democratic uh, to a republican and to a, a democratic president in the U.S., because continuity is an important attribute of foreign policy. But then, if you argue this way, many people would say, then it cannot really be democratic, because people are, I mean, they change ideas too quickly. I mean, voters. So better to give this in the hands of the executive, because they are the more competent people. Um, and also because people are usually uninformed. Foreign policy is a difficult domain, and people are not really equipped, trained to understand all the intricacies and all the little details about foreign policy. So better again leave that to the expert or the top politicians, not to the electorate. Heavy democratic checks and balances uh, would damage the credibility of the executive. So better leave that uh, to, into the hands of somebody else. Current legislature might reject its foreign policy commitments, and tomorrow's legislature could unmake the commitments of today taken by the executive. So this would damage, again, the credibility of the country and the predictability. Uh, even Kant, at some point, held that citizens should not be 
consulted when the issue of raising taxation for wars is at stake. They would not be equipped for a sensible understanding of the situation. So it's not only a current debate. I mean, there have been some sort of uh, um, uh, very not so important uh, uh, reference to this. Um, so this is to say that, OK, foreign policy is usually put aside as a special category. Both in normative theory and in, in, in the observation of how democracy is uh, practiced, not only how democracy is conceptualized normatively, but also how democracy is practiced. We see that very often it's, it's, uh, it's in the hands of the president, of the prime minister, of the executive, anyway. Instead, I do think that uh, it's important to think uh, of foreign policy as an important element of democracy. And, uh, oh, sorry, I just forgot this. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, what is uh, uh, here we are. Um, the mismatch, the asymmetry, as I was saying. Um, instead, I think we need to look at these three dimensions of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's really where the the, the, the normative action is, and we need to think about this. So let me go one by one, and so and then we can uh, discuss these things. Well, first of all, internal procedures. Uh, this is perhaps the most obvious. You would say, as any policy field, um, it is important that these policy decisions, foreign policy decisions, are taken through correct democratic procedures. That's, I would say, the, the least, least, less controversial uh, statement. Um, this is classical sort of uh, uh, input uh, legitimacy, so you, 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 you develop uh, correct procedures to which uh, decisions are taken uh, to a large, encompassing, inclusive uh, procedure. Um, from this perspective, foreign policy decision should be taken uh, in this way through processes that are transparent, that are participatory, that are accountable. Um, what do I mean? Well, for instance, parliamentary oversight of foreign policy decisions should be a key requirement for a democratic foreign policy. Because that's the moment in which there is a wider participation, that's the moment in which transparency is enacted most of the time. Instead, many decisions are taken by the executive only. Perhaps shared only with a very limited segment of the parliament. Special committees, special commissions, but not with some decisions are not even shared with the entire parliament. Think about all the issues about intelligence, secret services. In most of the countries, they are not discussed by the entire parliament, but only by a special commission. So, there is a, actually a lack of knowledge of the parliament. I'm not talking about the citizens, but even the parliament itself doesn't know precisely what is going on in many uh, foreign policy um, contexts. And I do think this is good for, I mean, this makes, a, I mean, creates a problem in democratic theory. We should instead create a wider participation of different actors, political parties, civil society, social parties, think tanks, universities, as much as foreign policy should be fully included in electoral campaigns, debates, manifestos, should be a crucial element of public debate, which most of the time it is not. Um, however, it is also important to develop and promote a widespread democratic culture of foreign policy. Um, Protest on foreign policy should be allowed, and media should have uh, full access to the material and institutional debates on foreign policy. This is to some extent practiced by democratic countries, to some extent. A special consideration should be done on the role of intelligence and secret services. To what extent are they compatible with democracy? Um, I do think that it's essential that decision-making bodies keep an effective oversight of the operation of these agencies. 
Um, and uh, which is obvious, uh, but uh, um, but uh, in practice, very far from 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 being fully implemented. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is uh, instead it's important that uh, intelligence and secret services are controlled. We should also rethink when we think about procedure about the issue about the delimitation of the demos. I was talking with. Uh, yeah, you. Um, now, while in, for, in, for in global democracy there are some who argues that we should uh, uh, put equal weight to national and foreign, and because we are talking about global issues, so they should be on an equal standing. Of course, in foreign policy is different, and I do argue that nationals or residents or whatever, I mean, citizens of a specific country, uh, would be, uh, would have normative priority. However, I do think also that foreigners uh, should be taken into account to some extent because they are the bearer of the consequences of the decision taken by uh, the nationals uh, who take decision to procedure in foreign policy. So, to my extent, there is no equal standing. However, there should be a consideration of foreign actors. There have been some proposals in this direction to include partial representation of foreigners into national decision-making processes. There's been discussion about fuzzy citizenship. There's been discussion about uh, foreign policy that should be decided also in consultation with foreign publics, which is not done most of the time. <coughs> I, mean, I, say, I decide what I want to do in foreign policy, and I do. But is that really legitimate? Um, there are some, uh, Blatter, for instance, who propose to grant transnational voting power in national parliaments to foreign non-residents, i.e., country A does any kind of foreign policy action in country B, decision should be taken, of course, by the, the government and the parliament of country A, but also in consultation, somehow, with the citizens of country B, because they are the ones who are going to suffer the consequences of those foreign policy actions. So some classical procedural issues, but also some more controversial issues about how we redraw the boundaries of the demos, which has been a discussion that has been going on for many years at the level of global democracy, but it's, it is a discussion that needs to be developed also at the level of foreign policy. Okay, so that's for, for, for internal procedure. Uh, goals. What kind of goals are compatible with the democratic theory? Uh, I don't think that the democratic state, a democratic system, is expected to carry out at the international level a specific set of policy that favor the consolidation of flourishing of democracy everywhere. And this is based on a kind of principle of impartiality and universality that I do think are essential ingredients of democratic theory. So for me, there are three goals that uh, the democratic country should uh, pursue in its foreign policy objectives. First, promoting human rights to the extent that is possible, as much as, mu as, much as possible, okay, we can discuss. But I do think that the democratic country should uh, promote human rights. Or, if you want, you can put it the other way around. A democratic country should not violate human rights in its foreign policy action. Now, you could argue, no, well, the, the classical view is it doesn't matter. If a country is democratic, then it can also violate the human rights of other, of other citizens. That doesn't affect the democratic characteristics of the country. But I would question this. Uh, I think if a democratic country violates human rights of other citizens in other countries, that damage the credibility, the credential, the democratic credential of that country. First. Second, I do think that a country, a democratic country, should promote democracy in other countries. Now, how? That's very important. I think the use of force is the least 
plausible. But in soft forms, in non-intrusive forms, uh, carried out via social, via civil society, stopped as soon as a sustainable democratic system is in place, uh, avoiding the risk of authoritarian paternalism, I do think um, that's an important element. You can also express this the other way around. A democratic country should not support authoritarian countries. You can always turn the other way around. And I think it gets clearer. Third, yes, a democratic country should also try to democratize. In order to be fully democratic, international institutions. Actions. What a country that claims to be democratic should do in terms of foreign policy actions. So we have seen procedures, we have seen goals, actions. Well, I do think that a democratic country is expected to be law abiding at the international level. They should comply with international law and treaties, and they should keep them under effective judicial enforcement and open to international judicial review. I do think this is part of the democratic theory at the international level. A democratic country, I argue, should also be open to universal jurisdiction for a number of serious crimes. A democratic country should prioritize diplomatic procedures over the use of force, because the democratic system is based on a peaceful institution-based and law-based conflict resolution mode rather than the use of force. So if you stick to this principle internally, I do think you should stick to this principle also in your external action. Should prefer multilateralism over unilateralism as much as at the domestic level the parliament is a multilateral system rather than a unilateral system. They should seek cooperative over competitive modes of interaction. Though, of course, this would entail a, a strong revision of what we understand as national interest. And this very, goes very deep to a crucial topic in international affairs. But I do think a democratic country should have a cooperative mood rather than a, co a competitive, aggressive, uh, zero-sum game attitude in international affairs. A, country, a democratic country should prioritize interaction with other similarly minded democratic countries. I do think this is in line with a kind of normative principles. But then there are also other things that a country, a democratic country should not do. Because that would diminish the, the, its own democratic credentials. I do think that a, a country should not have a secret army. They should not develop unaccountable acts of war, should not rely on proxy wars and proxy um, uh, in order to develop its own foreign policy, uh, should not support paramilitary attacks, should not have an <coughs> aim to political assassination of foreign leaders. Now, this has happened and continues to happen, okay? The history of Cold War, Cold War is full of this. Even today, today the, 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 the South Korean army has a special team there just to kill Kim Jong-un. I mean, this openly. I mean, this is part of the army that is exclusively dedicated, planning and ready to kill the leader of the rival country. Now, is this legitimate in a democratic system? Yeah, you could say, oh, but North Korea is a very authoritarian, bad regime. Yes, yeah, fair enough. But I'd say, is that legitimate from a political, democratic mm, uh, paradigm? I would question this. 
action of deliberate disinformation, direct interference in the electoral process of other nations. I do think a country should not do this if it is a democratic country. As well as, even more, a democratic country should not conquer other countries. So the idea that, oh, but the, the, the European democracies have been the first democracies of the world. Well, I mean, if you are a colonial power, I would argue your democratic credentials are very weak. A legitimate settlement. Yeah, the only democracy in the Middle East. Yes, fair enough. Israel. But there are some actions, foreign policy actions of Israel, that are not in line with the democratic credentials. As well as, of course, other more brutal things, extermination, genocide. I mean, this is something that the democratic country should not do if it wants to qualify and claim to be a democracy. Even if, even if this is decided through democratic procedure internally. Because you could say, okay, but I took a very participatory, uh, with a full parliamentary oversight decision to exterminate country X. Then this is a democratic, I'm a democratic country. No, I would argue procedure, internal procedures are important, but they're not enough. Mm -hmm. They cannot justify uh, in democratic terms, I'm not talking about ethical terms or justice terms, I'm talking about democratic terms. They cannot justify everything. I mean, not everything go, hmm, goes. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let me move uh, to, the, to the conclusions. Um, but this is just a bit summing up what we were saying. We were looking at procedures, goals, and, uh, and actions uh, uh, with a number of uh, uh, sort of secondary principles and policies that we should be implementing. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Now, I do think this follows a bit, this article follows a bit the, the zeitgeist, the, 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 the climate, the intellectual climate of, the, of, of, of today. In the 90s, there was this liberal, western, triumphalistic understanding of the system. Win in the Cold War, everybody would have followed so the sort of the western liberal principles. And so there was a clear idea that, yes, of course, then the next step would be to democratize fully international institutions, more and more countries are becoming democratic internally, and then really the challenge is to democratize international institutions, then everything will be solved. Now, we live in a very different world. First of all, there is no more Western democratic triumphalism, because there are competitive systems that are politically, economically, and I would say also normatively strong. And uh, so the idea today of, let's say, oh, okay, we democratize international institutions with a number of top leading countries in international affairs that are not democratic sounds a bit, a bit unrealistic for the moment. So I do think it's much more urgent politically to think about what we can do and what we should do in terms of democratic countries in, what we, in dealing with other countries in our own foreign policy. So, I do think that a more focused view is more fitting with the spirit of the time. This is mostly, a, I mean, it is a discourse for liberal countries only, for democratic countries. To me, another word project seems the project of asymmetric democratization of foreign policy, which in itself may perhaps provide the only viable avenue to relaunch the legitimacy of democratic liberalism on the basis of a consistent application of democratic ideals, also to foreign policy domain. Mm -hmm. So in a way, democracy is questioned, and the moment you go to any controversial area, 
I would argue that the top topic, the question, the legitimacy of Western country is precisely their foreign policy behavior. So I do think that foreign policy is the place where democratic thinking should be reapplied to to, 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 to project and relaunch the legitimacy of the overall democratic system. This would provide a better understanding, normative understanding of the world in which we live, and I would say would combine in a consistent way national sovereignty and global order. First. Second, if we understand foreign policy this way, we need to rethink about how we measure foreign policy. You remember at the beginning I showed you some sort of uh, indexes of, our, of democracy. Well, I do think that we should revise those indexes by adding a further variable. Of course, we keep all the domestic variables. These are important. But we should have few variables about foreign policy. So maybe the ranking would be different. Maybe some of the most uh, democratic countries that we, what well, some of the countries that we think are the best democratic example in the world today, would go down in the ranking because we consider also foreign policy. Again, this is not a zero one system, it's by degrees. But I would think that if we take into consideration procedures about foreign policy, goals about foreign policy, and actions about foreign policy, we will we would see a different ranking of how countries are democratic or, 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 or not. <clears throat> and of course, the two extreme would be uh, sort of a, a maximum degree of democracy and a minimal or no no democracy at all. And then let me conclude with uh, a feasibility argument, which I do think it's important. And any normative thinking should also take into account feasibility. Now, we should think to what extent a democratic foreign policy might be performing well in conditions of asymmetry, in conditions, in a condition, in a context in which not all countries are democratic. So fair enough, if we think, okay, in an ideal world, every country is democratic, then how countries should behave vis-a-vis -vis one, one another. Fair enough. But the world in which we live is not that. Yeah. The world in which we live <coughs> is some democracy and some non-democratic countries. Uh, so feasibility argument is about how, I mean, the arguments that I've formulated today about democratizing foreign policy performed in a system in which other countries are not democratic, hence also their foreign policy is not democratic. Okay? Would a state implementing a democratic foreign policy in an asymmetric way be delivering? Is a unilateral democratic foreign policy sustainable? I do think this is a difficult question. This is the old debate between the normative superiority versus political inferiority. The ultimate question I do think is about trade-off. To what extent are we ready to give up a portion of democratic ideals, a portion of our democratic credentials, in favor of political effectiveness in an international context in which democracy is not ubiquitous, is not everything? Because, I mean, when we think about principle, we should also think about how they can actually be implemented in political terms. And we, we, we might actually end up with a kind of paradox in which you have normative principles, democratic normative principles, that impose a certain foreign policy action in terms imposed to deliver something in foreign policy, like human rights or promotion. But then you understand, maybe in visibility terms, that in order to deliver human rights promotion, you need to be undemocratic internally. 
And so you might end up in a situation in which normative principle imposes implementation, but implementation imposes or requires that you forget a bit about your normative principle, because otherwise you will, will never be delivering the goals that you want to achieve, like human rights and democracy in other countries. That might be, and actually it is a bit, uh, one of the arguments that is sometimes used. Uh, so in that sense, I do think we ended up in a kind of paradox, a kind of, what uh, you say, catch-22 situation. Huh? It's a kind of democratic paradox of foreign policy, if you want, or perhaps a kind of democratic paralysis in which you have principle, you want to, this principle to deliver, to have an impact, but then you realize that in order to have an impact, you should forget a bit about democracy by, and go back to a classic and more sort of realist life foreign policy, because that's the best way to deliver for uh, the goals that you want to deliver. Okay, um, with this I conclude. I, I hope I was clear enough. I look forward to discuss this with you. Thank you. Uh, so I want to start with the people that are going to go set up our reception. Uh, see if you have any questions. Susan, Cam, Sumru. I wanted to also to acknowledge and make sure everybody knows Sumru, who is our um, uh, senior research fellow and center assistant. And if you ever have any issues or questions, she can answer them all. <laughs> so I'm always asking. Um, Ken. Yeah, <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Um, so my question is about the boundaries of foreign policy. Uh -huh. So it's not obvious, I would argue, what actually falls under the category of foreign policy and what doesn't. And the reason I say that is so you can think of many examples, like uh, the financial crisis in the United <coughs> States had incredible amounts of ripple effects all over the world. Um, food speculation over food commodities, on Wall Street and the playing a role in the Arab Spring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So should we limit ourselves to the kind of classical foreign policy concerns of war and diplomacy? It's not obvious to me that we should, right? But then I feel like then isn't there a demarcation problem due to the like um, the great interdependence between states that you started talking about at the beginning? What so that rather the question is like not what aspects of policy are there, you know, we, when we talk about foreign policy, war and diplomacy, then we have to think of democratically. Rather, I would say, what, policy, what, what policies are there that aren't, that aren't foreign in the sense that they end up affecting people outside the borders? Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, of course, you could say that uh, even dropping this pen is creating an effect somewhere else, you know, you know this butterfly effect in mm -hmm. Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, okay, and then I should consult Australian before dropping the pen. Yes, this might be the case. But I, I do think there are ways to sort of to manage and to operationalize this. Mm -hmm. The most obvious, though not the, though not the final way, would be you Australian you think that me dropping this affects you or not? Maybe asking them. That would be already a step forward. Mm -hmm. Of course, they could argue, yes, it does, and I would think, no, it doesn't, and then, okay, how do we solve the conflict? I do think we, you need to go one level up. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why you also need international institutions, because international institutions, to me, democratic international institutions, maybe I should dance with you, uh, are there to um, precisely solve uh, uh, the issue of the conflicts of competences. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, when you have conflicting claims about uh, influence, damage, effects of transnational, um, and you cannot sort of uh, solve peacefully these, then you need to move one level up. And so, okay, I claim it does not, your Australian claim it does, well, let's ask you, I don't know, Brazilian, what they think. Maybe other people can. Um, <clears throat> or maybe uh, you need a global parliament. Okay, that's an old uh, position. Um, but uh, so it is true that obviously this can be an endless thing. But I also argue that uh, um, would argue that uh, um, that if it is true that our actions continuously affect the others, 
Well, then we should uh, get ready to bear the consequences of that in normative terms. And so we should be ready to understand if, that if I drop a pen like this, this should be democratically accountable. Also to Australians. Okay, this is a silly example. But, and, oh, but this is crazy. Well, you want to be normatively consistent or not? You could say, oh, okay, it's crazy, so I don't care about normative consistency. I just live, uh, want to live an easy life. Okay, fair enough. But then, I mean, I do think that if you, if you hold certain principles, and if you aim to be consistent, then there are a number of consequences. And even if these consequences are complex, and intricate, and difficult, fair enough. I mean, you, we need to develop systems that do take into account those uh, normative implications, because this is what uh, principles require us to do. With a limit, of course. I mean, I'm not saying that every single book, but... Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, drop pen, drop, maybe not, the economic crisis or other issues, environment, uh, well, yes, we should be... And we are moving in that direction. Susan? Okay. Well, Sumer, you want to go? Um, Okay, uh, let me call John first because I know he can't count the <laughs> um, I'm kind of curious as you know what the relationship is between all the features that you point out, the procedures that have goals um, and the box. So it seems to me maybe it actually would be easy to disaggregate some of these features with exactly how they would be related to democracy. Because you talked a lot about, like, well, maybe these aspects of foreign policy might be consistent with democracy. Sometimes you said it might undermine the legitimacy of the democracy. Sometimes you said that maybe it wouldn't make it democratic. And I think these seem to be all slightly different things. So it seems like some of the features that you suggest, yeah, if, if, a, if a democracy didn't uh, like fulfill that feature, maybe it would be no longer legitimate as a democracy. But some of the other things that you pointed out, seem like maybe that's just consistent with democracy, or it would be good if the democracy did that, or it was going to be super derogatory if the democracy did that. Um, and especially when you were kind of going between saying, well, you can either phrase it as like not violating human rights, or like promoting human rights, or like not, uh, or promoting it other democracies, or not supporting uh, like authoritarian regimes. That seemed to be definitely like a slippage between, uh, between these two kinds of uh, relationships to democracy. It seems like a, a, a democracy shouldn't violate human rights. And if it did, maybe that would undermine its legitimacy. But promoting human rights, for example, in other countries, you know, maybe that's sort of super derogatory, that's just going to be consistent with democracy. Um, or you might think, the, the case of like uh, thinking about what the demos is for democracy. Yeah, maybe that would undermine the legitimacy of democracy if you sort of did find ways to have other people participate. Um, so at the end, very end, you kind of talk, talked about this is like maybe we should expand the parameter that which we measure democracy. And you kind of spoke in terms of degrees, as if it's just one dimension. But I think maybe actually there are different dimensions, different relationships to democracy that you're point, pointing out. Uh, thanks. Um, no, I think it's it's an important point, um, but no, I do think. Uh, it, as I said, it's not zero one. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a matter of parametrized uh, these issues that I mentioned in, about procedure goals and, and actions. Um, and I do think uh, it is important to keep one single index for all of them. So, violate uh, human rights. Okay, if you fully support human rights, I give you zero point nine or one one point. If you promote human rights only on certain categories, well, maybe 0, 0 0.5. Uh, if you promote the human rights only of indigenous people, only of that, maybe 0, 3. If you're indifferent, uh, maybe 0, if you don't do anything about human rights. Yeah, well, maybe we kill the 10 people, then, okay, maybe minus 0 Sunday. Well, you know, we, we, we. We killed an entire minority in another country, or we contribute, we help the government to repress and kill a minority in their country. Well, then it's minus 0 0.5. Oh no, we committed a genocide, it's minus 0.5. Um, 
And then you go to another one and say, okay, promotion democracy, uh, pro democracy promotion in another country. If you promote it or sort of a democratic system, to what extent, if you supported an authoritarian system and that authoritarian system was doing many bad things, and then I give you points. Now, how much, how many points specifically for each country? Okay, we can discuss about this. But this is an issue about operationalization. Every index gives you points. Mm -hmm. So my idea is that what is important to me is that, okay, let's start thinking about a variable that takes into account this. Then the further question is, okay, how we operationalize the variable? So how many points or, or uh, sort of uh, zero point something we give for any action, positive or negative? Okay, that's a matter for discussion. But if you go to quality for, if you go to, I mean, they all take into account, I mean, they parameterize, they, 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 they operationalize the variable. I guess my question, though, is speaking about operational, operation, operationalizing it, still, <coughs> there's like one dimension, one relationship between all the features you pointed out and the box. And I'm, I'm, sort, think I'm sort of suggesting that there's really multiple features going on. So one is democratic legitimacy. Maybe some ways in which uh, democracies are acting towards other countries will undermine its legitimacy as a democracy. That's a, a more serious and a different kind of thing than just saying, democracies should do this. It would be good if they did this. It would be consistent with democracy if they did this. Right? So like, you know, democratizing global institutions, maybe that's a good thing. Country, democracy should try to do that, but it seems like, well, supporting a genocide, that really would undermine the legitimacy. Those are two separate things, or not taking into consideration the participation of others who should be participating within a particular you know, decision domain. That seems to violate like, the legitimacy of that democracy because it undermines like, the funded foundational norm for one. So those are two different things. Mm. If you want to operationalize it, sure. I mean, that's like a, a separate question. How do we operationalize these two things? But it seems like you're not just talking about one dimension of relationships. Um, yeah, no, I understand, but no, I would uh, reject, I mean, refuse this. I do think they are all elements of democratic legitimacy. As much as you consider elements of democratic legitimacy, the fact of having multi-party system, checks and balances, free media. And you might say, oh no, but, but free media is not really the legitimacy of the democratic system. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a wishful thing. I mean, uh, it would be good if there is also uh, media freedom. No, no, I don't think they are elements of a functioning democratic system. Hmm? And they bring legitimacy to the system. They are parameters and variables or requirements for legitimacy of the system. I would put all of them as elements and requirements of legitimacy. I understand that I mean, you want to differentiate them. But for me, for me, I mean, because we are accustomed, we are used to consider an, a very large number of domestic parameters. And we consider each of them a requirement for a legitimate democratic system. And I might say also at the international level, they should be all good. But I do understand, I mean, you have a different perspective. But that's why, that's why I mean, that's how I think about these things. I do think that they are all legitimate requirements by degrees. Just some more questions. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a, a couple questions. So real quick, um, I mean, firstly, your presentation, um, you know, some could, could interpret your presentation and the broad concept of democratic foreign policy as essentially reckless and naive. Mm. And I'm specifically thinking if, if you could specifically explain, uh, you know, a couple particular contexts. Because we understand that the purview of public morality is very different from private morality, especially as states engage in each other. So, for example, in negotiation, um, country A is negotiating with country B, you know, to, to jostle for advantages. There's certain things that need to be kept secret. How would you negotiate within that space, within a democratic foreign policy, in issues of war and peace, where two parties which are in a highly contested environment, say the Israelis and the Egyptians, how would you, within this democratic framework, provide for a context within which these negotiations could happen? And then the second part of my question is, your presentation seems to assume certain universal norms, and these democratic um, 
foreign policy, democracy is a universal norm, and that notion is highly contested um, within the international space. A lot of countries in the global south would argue that a lot of these universal norms are being imposed on them and end up creating war and creating conflict and disintegration in many countries. And we've seen this around the world. So if you could explain within those two contexts how this democratic foreign policy might be able to, to be operationalized. OK, thank you very much. Uh, to, again, another two interesting questions or challenges. Um, now, <clears throat> I'm not saying that everything should be sort of um, yeah, naive and uh, children-like. Hmm? Um, there might be moments of um, secrecy, intelligence, gathering, but I would argue that these are justified um, in a non-ideal world. For instance, intelligence, intelligence gathering. Intelligence entails that you violate the rules of and the law of the other country. Hmm? Because sort of uh, secret uh, informations are kept secret by each country. Hmm? So for you, foreign country, to get <coughs> that, those informations, you need to violate my own rule, law. That's by definition. That is what intelligence always do. That's okay? That's now, I would argue that under certain circumstances, in an ideal world, you should, you, you might do this toward vis-a-vis -vis non democratic country. Not always, but you should not do this with other democratic countries. Inside the European Union, well, a club of democracies, I do think it is questionable from a democratic perspective that there is intelligence activities between Italy and France, France and Germany, Germany and Italy, in which the Italian intelligence service, the French intelligence, and the German violate continuously the law of these three countries that are democrat democracies and part of the same democratic international institutions to gather information that are considered confidential and secret by their, their countries. I don't think this is not in line with the democratic uh, principles. So, however, in a non-ideal asymmetric world, there might be space for some uh, uh, secret uh, um, um, actions for some intelligence. And However, I do think there should be a point in which um, this should be disclosed. And the, the target of the disclosure is, is both your own domestic audience that needs to be informed about what the government is doing, because otherwise how can you demand democratic accountability if you don't know what the government is doing? Then, then it's also the most straightforward procedural way how can you, I mean, that's the democratic essential in terms of the democratic procedure is failing because you don't know what your government is doing. So, but also because you need to be accountable to the others. So I do understand that there might be room for that kind of more sort of secret and more power-based actions, uh, but this should be, should come at, at some point uh, sort of into a more maybe liberal, when the, results are achieved or whatever, I mean, they should be more um, transparent and accountable. Now, of course, deciding, uh, identifying the boundaries of this action is a very complex issue. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of other questions. Oh, sorry. And then, uh, so, sorry, I, I will move one on. Um, it, the yeah. universal norm, maybe this is a problem. Um, as I said, this is a, a normative argument for democratic countries for liberal countries. However, it is also an argument that claim that uh, democratic theories and principles have a normative universal validity. 
You might say, oh, but many people in the world don't believe this. Okay, fair enough. But, but then I don't see why democratic theory should apply to uh, the US or to Italy and not to other countries. I mean, what, what's the normative decision uh, criteria for saying, oh, no, this is only for Italian but not for uh, North Koreans? Why? I mean, I do think if a normative principle is there, it's there. So it's a universal argument. Okay, we have a bunch of... Uh, yeah, sorry, I will go... Okay, quick. I want to give a little priority to more students. Hold on. <coughs> okay, cool. Uh, thanks so much. So, um, earlier in your talk, you were, you were describing why you think there may be the standing assumption that uh, foreign policy is not the right candidate for, for democratization. And I understand, of course, that's not your opinion, ultimately, but I was curious about some of the, some of the reasons you gave. So, for instance, you mentioned that foreign policy we need stability and if the, the, the electorate is inconsistent then we can't have a democratic foreign policy because we get instability. Um, and I wondered, again I understand that, that you don't agree with where this argument goes ultimately, but I wonder what you think about the argument as far as it goes. Because I, I, when you first said that I thought, yeah that's true, we can't have a constantly changing foreign policy. But then the more that I thought about it, the more I thought, Maybe that doesn't set foreign policy apart from health policy or education policy. Maybe it's just uh, instability is just bad for policy generally. So I wondered if you thought, as far as it goes, there's some value to that idea. Is there something special about foreign policy that makes it require instability that might be kind of awkward candidate for, for democratization? Um, because you deal with somebody else. You don't deal with your, with your own constituency only. And so, in, in so far as you deal with somebody else, uh, the other has expectations, and expectations is is indeed a crucial sort of a feature of international affairs that we I R students we know that I mean, cooperation institutions are there because they, they are based on specific expectations. So yes, of course you can change, you can turn your foreign policy, you can change foreign policy directions. You can always do that because otherwise you would not be free. I mean, to determine yourself. I mean, so. Uh, but there are always costs, I mean, the, the standard argument, and on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, I mean, and costs, they are due to the fact that the others, once you start one foreign policy direction, the other expect you to, to continue that. So the moment you change, you sort of uh, uh, create instability in the expectation of the others. And, uh, this is one of the problems. And if you create a, a, a instability, uh, people will not believe you anymore. And if they will not believe you anymore, they will not trust you anymore. And then it's uh, hot. Yes. Okay. Anais and then Thank you very much. I think that you posed a really important, crucial question. And uh, that you just point out that classic liberal theory as positive foreign policy as outside the scope of uh, democratic consideration. But when you are rejecting equal standing, or when you say that you want to prioritize nationals, even though non-nationals may be affected, um, when you say that your model is kind of addressing liberal democracies uh, first of all, and it seems also your understanding of the demos is mainly national, so I I tend to worry that some of your premises end up somewhat reinforcing the existing IR understanding that ultimately disqualifies foreign policy from serious democratic consideration. And I'm not sure how your model really differs from the Rawlsian model that ultimately sets up foreign policy as outside the realm of democratic theory. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> no, I do think, uh, yeah, I mean, I understand this, uh, that uh, you might say, okay, but then they should have equal consideration, foreigners. Um, no, I do think there should be a reciprocal, but uh, consideration, but not equal. I mean, if it is me doing something in abroad in another country, I do think the other needs to be taken into account, but it, because I'm the agent, the actor, carrying out that specific uh, action, 
Um, most of the responsibility and most of the normative weight should be on me. As much as in a reciprocal way, if the country B intervenes in my territory, the country B is sort of, because it's the actor carrying out the action. Now, I, I understand you might say, ah, but because you suffer the consequences, then you should be in, in, entitled to an equal voice. I do think, and I argued that uh, if we talk about global democracy, global institution, then there is the place where it should be uh, an equal voice. Um, but I do think in foreign policy, because it's from me to you, but it's me acting and you, uh, it's, uh, that creates an, a, a normative asymmetry. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do understand the challenge, and I think it's there. And then you say, uh, how much of this? Uh, uh, that, how much of this asymmetry? Because then if you go along the line, then you could say, OK, I just, uh, OK, you talk, but I don't care about what you say. I, uh, I let you speak, and then I do whatever I want. No, there should be a bit more than that. Um, it's, uh, <coughs> This is a challenge. I, I, I reckon that, but. I want to try to get in three more questions. Okay. So then, yes. Oh. <clears throat> it's a bit of a conundrum with the whole uh, word democracy. Because what I, what, I think, what I think I'm hearing, um, the, the first part, you talk about the definition of democracy, um, which, which includes um, the legislative oversight of uh, foreign policy decision making, uh, which is which is all about the dynamics of power um, and doesn't yet um, in any way address or predict what the substance of the policies are going to be. And then when you when you get to uh, what the substance of our policy is going to be, um, you are uh, listing the characteristics of a democratic foreign policy, which actually um, Sounds like you could also say they're the characteristics of a virtuous foreign policy and an idealistic foreign policy. It's especially um, spotlighting uh, multilateralism um, rather than unilateralism, uh, which uh, which actually which actually has echoes of the common practice of using the word democracy to refer to all things that are good. Um, but what, uh, what I can't uh, get around is, is the fact that uh, democracy, if you define democracy as, um, as the people voting <coughs> and the majority prevailing, uh, democracy has the potential to bring to power uh, those, those movements which are all about unilateralism. Uh, such as the regime that we currently have in power in Washington, which wasn't elected uh, by pure democracy, but uh, was certainly elected by ostensible democracy. So doesn't, doesn't that make the word democracy rather limited in its ability to be used interchangeably with uh, virtuous and idealistic and multilateral? You want me to address it or yeah, to collect? Good. Okay. Um, okay, wait. Maybe we should collect. Right. Uh, hold the thought. Because I wanted to just get in um, along sort of similar lines. I really think you're um, taking democracy to include, um, I mean, there are some views that do so, to include a commitment to human rights as part of what it is to be democratic. So I just think it would be helpful to make that a little clearer, because it isn't necessarily obvious, uh, especially if one adopts a kind of broad conception of democracy, that, it's, um, that those are two interrelated conceptions, democracy and human rights, but that I don't think that you really, I mean, you're operating with a conception of democracy as voting, or as uh, you know, a system that doesn't necessarily entail a commitment to the kind of ethical sort of standards that are involved in human rights. You can't. I mean, there are interrelations between them, but I just think that your talk kind of elided that a bit. And also, just a, a reference. Well, I should hear the last question. Was it Asher? Oh, uh, yeah, I had just a couple concerns about the uh, uh, the way national sovereignty is introduced. So it's like, uh, 
There seems to be uh, an understanding, um, and correct me if this is a mischaracterization, but um, uh, there's a prioritization of democratic norms over national sovereignty, which is all well and good until we get to the issue of, well, if a country is deemed undemocratic or insufficiently democratic, um, are other international actors less obligated to respect their sovereignty as a nation? Yeah. And let me just add one little more thing that was my, well, two other small things. Um, one is I think that it would be important to spell out what the forms of democratic input are that you're proposing or would propose for other countries. And to, uh, I mean, you spoke about just asking the Australians or something. I mean, what would, what, how would you operationalize, I've argued to this actually, about democratic input on when are the actions of a given polity impact the basic human rights, which includes subsistence rights of other countries. But, you know, how would you operationalize that would be uh, one question. My last question is about the impact, which is actually what I meant by an, uh, one aspect of the question, not Democratic versus Republican. But um, what would happen if you actually democratize um, policy, foreign policy, um, and for collective responsibility? Because would it, would it have the impact that each and every citizen could properly be held responsible, uh, which is actually an argument that's made that, uh, to justify uh, all kinds of bad things, uh, which it wouldn't justify, but I'm just noting that, uh, for example, uh, terrorism against civilians is justified by some various actors as justified because they live in a country that's democratic <laughs> in the sense that the people are responsible for the foreign policy. So uh, okay. that's just something to think about for the future. You don't have to comment on it now. But it's a kind of interesting conundrum. I certainly wouldn't want to be held responsible for all of the policies of the United States right now, mainly because I didn't have a role in, you know, I reject them. I vote against them. Uh, so anyway, that's just something for the future. So you have a bunch of questions here. Oof. Okay. Five um, minutes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, uh, virtuous foreign policy or democratic foreign policy? Um, no, I do think that this uh, can be uh, considered sort of uh, um, requirements, not only not uh, super rogatory, but uh, sort of uh, uh, obligations to qualify as uh, democracy. Again, by degrees. Hmm? Uh, why multilateralism? What has multilateralism to do with democracy? Um, as I said, I mean, because, I mean, you can conceptualize the domestic, uh, any parliament, as a multilateral sort of mechanism to take decisions in a country. And indeed, if you, if you look at how international institutions were created, mostly by the West, mostly by the US, after World War II, they were uh, developed, of course, with special conditions, uh, looking at the internal American political system, trying to duplicate as much as possible at the international level. Of course, with all the conditions, oh, but then what about what be the power? But that's, that's historically how I mean, the UN was uh, thought about by many um, actors at that time, after World War II. Um, so I do think that, okay, we use different words. But multilateralism is is a way to, 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 to conceptualize decision making in which everybody is included. And that I do think this is a way to understand democracy. A system in which everybody is included. The way we do. Um, human rights. Uh, no, I do argue that I mean human rights are preconditions for democracy. Mm -hmm. Uh, you cannot argue, I understand not everybody might agree with that, but I do think that uh, certain, I mean, basic human rights plus participatory human rights, participatory entitlement, are conditions for, 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 for democratic system, and because they are conditions for a democratic system, they should be promoted both internally and externally, because they are, I mean, that's why I consider them preconditions. 
if you are in a demo if yes, sovereignty depends on democrat democracy. The legitimacy of national sovereignty in this account depends on how much you are democratic. Does that mean that if you are not so democratic, we cannot we can sort of override and disrespect your sovereignty? To some extent, yes. To some extent, yes, I do think so. Uh, how? Well, no, probably not intervening and killing you, because, but I do think that if you uh, violate the human rights of your own citizens, and if you violate human rights of other citizens in another country, then the international community has a duty to intervene, and then your sovereignty is not there. But this, that, I mean, that goes back to the tension with human, human rights and, 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 and sovereignty, and I do think the balance should be really on, on human rights, the way I understood this precondition for democracy. So, yes, I mean, but I mean, it's already a long time that, have been, that we have questioned the ultimate legitimacy of sovereignty per se. So this is not really very innovative, but it's pretty much. Um, how we operationalize the impact, as I said, I do think uh, consultation is very important. And that's why, that goes back to my old uh, story about uh, global democracy. Uh, we need a global forum in which Australia might argue whether this is impacting their life or not. And I do think this, the forum is a global parliament. And there are many reasons why we need a global parliament, but that's definitely one. Because it's not enough that I assess the impact of my pen, but I want actually, potentially, every single person in the world saying whether the pen is affecting or not affecting his or her life. Because otherwise, I'm taking decisions paternalistically on the other lives. So everybody needs to be, in principle, potentially uh, listened. Uh, how true democratic procedures and participants. Um, responsibility of every single res individual. Yes, I do think so. I do think so. Not that because of that you need, but. If you are a democratic government, not your American, but any democratic government, and commits <coughs> wrongdoing, and then is, for instance, uh, um, forced to pay compensation, I do think it's right that taxes are imposed also on you, minority, in order to pay for the compensation for the wrongdoing of your country. Because that's the sense of collective responsibility. Once you participate in the democratic system, you are responsible anyway. Either you win or you won, or either you are majority or minority. Still, you participate to the system. You don't accept the system, you destroy your passport and you ask asylum seeker somewhere else. But the moment you stay in the system, you take responsibility for the overall system as you go. So, classic example, as I said, taxation. You should be ready to pay taxation for compensating the wrongdoings of your country if they are committed in the Well, at the moment. Yes. Okay. Anyway, at the moment, all I can offer, by the way, <laughs> as a compensation. is, is wine and cheese, and it'll be available hopefully for informal discussion there. So please join me in thanking. Uh, Robert.